Buongiorno. They said that I first I want to thank you for speaking English. But I'm going to do my talk in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> only kidding. I wouldn't even How do you say only kidding in Italian? Okay, I don't know what you said, but that's what I meant. <laughs> like, grazie. Um, and uh, thank you. Did you get it? Or? No? There you go. Okay, cool. Um, this is my blog, by the way. Or this is how I edit my blog. Um, and I don't know. I don't have a prepared uh, speech today. And that's... Uh, we were talking about being smart and creativity. And this is part of how you be creative, is you just throw yourself into something without any idea where it's going. And you trust that you'll get an idea somewhere along the line that leads to something interesting. Um, in a situation like this, we've got, I don't know, what, two, 300 people in this room? Um, I'm just one person up here, and if you consider all the, it's, no matter how smart, I guess the premise is that I'm so smart that you all want to like know what I, th like, what I think, but if you add up what all you people know, it, it's, that's where this intelligence is. It's sitting here in the room. Um, Paulo said that, uh, that I started blogging and podcasting and RSS and all that, but it was more about how to trick other people into doing these things. You know, I do, I'm a software developer. That's what I do. When I wake up in the morning, um, I write code. And so I don't write your blog posts for you. You do that. Um, and so we're going to try to do something here today that may be unusual. Um, so would you guys stand up and show yourselves, the guys with the microphones, please? Raise your hand. and. Now, why are you here and not there? You need to be out there, where the people are. Are they out there? I don't see them. Where are they? Oh, does anybody have something they want to say right now? A question they want to ask? I'll talk for a little bit, but, you know, we can start off with that. So this is going to be interactive. This is going to be what we call a conversation. I think Doc Searles spoke here last year. Doc likes to say markets are conversations. I'm going to say that conferences are conversations. Um, one of the things we do when we get these conferences going is we sing a song. Anybody interested in singing a song? Yes? What song would you like to sing? I need a microphone on this person. Yes? I'll sing if other people sing. I'm sorry, I can't. I'll sing if other people sing. Yes, that's the whole point. We want everybody else to sing. I'll sing. That's my deal, too. So what song should we sing? Volare? Do you all know? I was thinking, I was trying to think of an Italian song that I know. No? All right. Well, we'll come back to this. I think this might be a bit of a stretch. Um, so the first speaker talked about creativity. And uh, maybe we're losing it. I, I, I forget exactly what he said. Um, but my experience with creativity is that you have to actually practice it. You have to learn how to do it. It's not something, whatever evolution taught us to do, it didn't really teach us how to be creative. It taught us more about how to get along with each other. And the thing I see my friend from Carnegie Mellon there shaking her head. Yes, she's agreeing. It taught us because, because getting along with each other helped keep us alive and, and helped have our uh, genes passed along to the next generation. It was a survival skill. Um, but we've evolved now to the point where well, we actually do need a lot of creativity from all of us. Um, you know, I got asked, asked a question. I was at a party at uh, Paolo's house the other day. And we were sitting out uh, in the backyard, and some of the guys were smoking cigars, and we were drinking. And one of the guys was tweeting, and uh, somebody asked him to ask me a question, whether I foresaw podcasting, right? You were the guy, right? Um, whether I thought of podcasting when I was doing RSS. And I said, no, not at all. 
And I was thinking back, what a ridiculous question. <laughs> the circumstances under which I did RSS or designed it or invented it or whatever were basically to get a guy from Microsoft off my back. Um, he had been pestering me and saying, you need to do something with XML. And I kept saying, I don't want to do anything with XML. And he kept coming back to me and saying, well, we need you to do something with XML. So I just did something with XML. I wasn't thinking about uh, aggregation. I wasn't thinking about what eventually happened with RSS. It was just a first step. These things are always like that. You just take one step, you throw something out there, you see what happens. In that case, nothing happened for a year. Nothing happened with RSS for a year. Um, and then uh, we needed more creativity and more creativity. Uh, what happened in a year later, I, I did my first, do you have a question? Oh, I hear you talking to me, so I thought, do, you might have a question, no? These people are here too. By the way, you want creativity? This is some creativity right here. I've never seen a podium that was actually a screen. Isn't that interesting? So. That's my job, I think, to point out a little bit of it here and there. Um, so what happened was Netscape uh, came along and decided they liked what I had done with uh, my format, and they copied it. But they didn't exactly copy it. They did what technology people often do, which is to sort of copy it but be incompatible. And it's the kind of thing that, oh, you're talking to the guy on, on there over there, right? Oh, okay, got it. It's distracting <laughs> to have somebody talking in your ear. So they, uh, they copied it, and I decided to go with their copy, which surprised them, you know, because usually what happens is when uh, you fight them, you decide to, I'm going to, that's a very nasty thing they did. I'm just going to fight them and resist what they've done. Um, instead, I did the surprising thing, which I think this was maybe the greatest act of creativity was I decided to just join them, just to do exactly what they were gonna do, to say uncle. And they were so surprised that they turned around and then did everything that I did. And all of a sudden we have a standard, uh, which taught me a very important lesson, which is it's not the first person who has the opportunity to create a standard, rather it's the second person that does. So if I say we should call this conference oh, I don't know, cheese, let's call this the cheese conference. And Paulo says, no, this is the state of the net conference. Well, then we have an argument. But Paulo could say, well, let's call it the cheese conference. And now all of a sudden we've got a name, right? So it's, it's, um, it was another technique we used in doing a, a protocol called XML RPC, which is sort of buried in the sort of infrastructure of the net now. You don't hear a lot about it. Um, but we had a meeting. This was a project that I did with a couple of guys at Microsoft. And we had a meeting to talk about how this would work. And I proposed that we should try to come up with the worst names for everything. Because what happens in technology discussions is that we get into endless arguments about what the best name is for something. And I felt that we could sidestep, because the name doesn't matter. I mean, you could call this the Cheese Conference if you wanted, and eventually people would forget that it's a really strange name, right? <laughs> and they would just come, and it wouldn't matter. I mean, I thought State of the Net was kind of like dorky when I first heard it. I said, you know, but it sort of grows on you, and you know, it becomes. Um, so anytime, and of course, being techies like we were, uh, we fell into the trap and people started saying, well, I think a better name for this would be blah. And, um, and then we would all have a good laugh and say, well, what we really wanted was the worst name, so we don't have to listen to you. Um, so that was fun. Um, does anybody have anything they want to say or have any? You don't have to, these don't have to be questions. You could just say, hey, you're nuts, that's wrong, or I have a nice story I want to tell that goes with that. Oh, here we go, Ewan. This is Mr. Ewan Semple, a famous blogger. Oh, I don't know about that, Dave. Okay, um, uh, I do. <laughs> my question was gonna be about the way you're doing this. Okay. And the is it, How do you feel about it? Is it okay? I was okay? gonna say the, le the level of comfort or discomfort that people feel with that. 
And Should I stop? No, no, not at okay. all. But okay. The point was the opposite. Because we're so used to not being creative. Right. And, and not, not being serendipitous. And we're used to the conventions of conferences where somebody talks and we listen. Yes. And one of the frustrations I feel with the internet is that we have this technology that celebrates and encourages and increases that serendipitous way of living and working, but many people are very uncomfortable with it. Well, do you feel that most people participate in the net, or do you feel that, um, that most people are listening on the net? Most people are still listening. Is that right? Interesting. Has everybody, do people agree with that? Would the net work better if more people participated in it? Yes. I do. You don't? You don't think, you no, don't No, no, I do. I agree with you. There's a lot, a huge amount of people just watching. And like, like here today. On, on Actually, we see people On Facebook leave. too. On Facebook too. And I, I'm one of, of them many, many times. Really? All right, well, let's see if we can draw you out. We've already drawn you out a little bit. Um, one of the things I heard at the cocktail party last night is that people are very concerned about Facebook here. And we've heard Facebook brought up a few times. Um, my own story about Facebook is I, I sort of resented it when I first heard about it because I like to be an early adopter of things. I don't like to be, you know, and in the case of Facebook, well, ironically, I could have been an early adopter because I was working at Harvard at the same time that uh, Mark Zuckerberg was at Harvard. And if I had known about Facebook, I could have joined it <laughs> because I had all the credentials I needed to be in it. But that's how separate this was from the, the faculty, which is what I was at the time, and the student body. We were so separate that I didn't even know. And here I am, a guy who like does blogging software. And at the time, I was booting up a blogging program at Harvard. This was 2003. And uh, over across campus, there was Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and he was uh, booting up Facebook on the very same campus. Um, but I didn't. And I couldn't join it once I left Harvard. And, uh, and then once they opened it up to the rest of the world, I, I felt Resent, I resented Facebook. I didn't like the idea that here's this you know, whole communication system that booted up and I wasn't part of it. Um, but a friend of mine, who you may have heard of, Robert Scoble, um, he pestered me and he said, you really need to be on Facebook. And I said, yeah, I don't know, things are okay without Facebook, I'm fine. Um, and uh, but eventually I did sign on, and now I'm glad that I did. Um, because you have to sort of accept that Facebook is there. It's a fact of life. Anything that you do, I mean, raise your hand if you feel like you're a creative person in the context of the internet. Are you creative? Are you trying to create things? No, no, no. Well, if you are, okay, this is my advice. I'll give all the advice you want, you just have to ask for it, okay? Um, this is a bit that you didn't ask for, um, is if you're creative and you resent Facebook, you need to get over it. Because it's a institution. It's an institution that is larger than the Italian government in terms of its reach. It's larger than the United States government, where I come from. Um, it's larger than, than anything, really, in the sense that it is, and it's amazing machine because it ties, look at a billion people are tied together by this one computer network. I mean, that's remarkable. Um, whatever comes next, okay, and I think we all agree that there will be more things after Facebook. Even Zuckerberg agrees that there'll be more after Facebook. Um, whatever it is, it will respect Facebook. By respect, what I mean is, it won't ignore it. It won't pretend it didn't exist. It will be relevant in the context of Facebook. Every layer of technology that's come along, uh, say the web came along in the early to mid 90s, it didn't disrespect Windows and Macintosh. It didn't exist outside the context of Windows and Macintosh. Because Windows and Macintosh is how people got onto the net in the first place. So whatever comes next, 
If you want to be part of that, if you dream about inventing the thing that comes next, it's going to recognize Facebook. It's going to be, it might use Facebook, it might use the Facebook APIs, it might connect to Facebook in some meaningful way, it might steal a lot of ideas, it will definitely steal a lot of ideas from Facebook. Nothing, the next thing will have to be something like Facebook, but, well, if I knew what it was, I would make it. I don't. Uh, but we'll, we'll iterate towards it and we'll try to find it. So you have to accept it. To say that, well, what are we going to do about Facebook is a weak, powerless thing to say. Because you can't do anything about Facebook. It's like saying, what can I do about the weather? I can't do anything about the weather. So you accept it and you build with it. And maybe Facebook, uh, we, you know, these guys that run these companies, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, whoever started IBM, there's sort of a, a trend, a thread here. Um, and they all come into these, into power thinking that they have it figured out. They know how to avoid the traps that the previous generation didn't avoid. Uh, I grew up going to conferences where Bill Gates was the, the keynote speaker and uh, Gates would get up and he would say, uh, well, I know I could do my Bill Gates imitation now, but I, you know, I'm in Italy, that would probably be rude. Um, and he would get up and say, well, I know why IBM, and by the way, this was before IBM had screwed up. He was already saying, I know how my predecessors screwed up. He was thinking of IBM and a company called Digital Equipment, which probably a lot of you have never heard of. Have any of you heard of DEC? Digital? So you have to be a certain age or from a certain culture to have heard of it. I mean, I grew up also admiring, totally admiring DEC. I loved their computers. If you were a computer science student uh, in the 70s and 80s like I was, um, you know, DEC was the best. Didn't get any better. Uh, what Gates was saying is, well, I know how I'm going to kill these guys, <laughs> and I'm not going to be making the same mistakes that they made. And I, I believe that he did not make the same mistakes, but he made similar mistakes. Um, when the web came along, what Gates, saw, and I was, uh, I had a, f a front row seat to this, uh, because this was at the time we were booting up blogging, and we didn't call it blogging, it wasn't called that then. I was running an email uh, newsletter called DaveNet, and it was also on the web, and, um, and Gates was one of my readers, and people would reply to the emails and then I would run their replies in the, uh, in the outgoing. So I wrote a piece, I had this epiphany. Oh my God, Bill Gates is over. He lost. And of course, this wasn't apparent to anybody at all at, all at the time. It, this was a, a, a purely personal epiphany. This wasn't something anybody else was seeing. Uh, what I had experienced was I had basically stopped doing everything I was doing. I just, when I found the web, I said, I'm not doing anything else. This is what I'm gonna work on, you know? And I had been a PC developer, Mac developer at the time. And the industry at that time was mired in this just awful clutter of complicated protocols and all these self-serving, they were mostly self-serving. They were, they were complicated precisely to keep the proponents in power. You know, they made it difficult for, they could, they made it difficult to interop. Interop is a very sort of key idea. Interop means I can take this, I can take your hardware and pull it out and replace it with somebody else's hardware or the same thing for software. Well, at, at their core, these companies really don't want interop. What they want is the opposite of interop. They want lock-in. And uh, so that's what they were doing. They're having a great big lock-in battle at the time. And Microsoft had a set of protocols called COM, and Apple and IBM had teamed up to make something called OpenDoc, and they had formed a consortium called Taligent, and they had brought in a company called Novell and Borland, and it was this horrible mess. And all these, and it, you needed a bookshelf worth of documentation to, to, to understand this stuff. And along comes the web, and it's doing everything that that bookshelf is doing and the documentation for it is the size of a small magazine. That doesn't, I don't think they're, but 
you know, I, looking in hindsight, you have to say, well, that doesn't seem like much of an epiphany. If you can do the same thing with, a, with that little amount of technology versus that much technology, it's obvious that this one's going to win, right? But that wasn't the way people thought. People thought that what mattered was how much money you had. You know, IBM had all the money in the world. Microsoft had huge money, had just defeated IBM in the, uh, with Windows 3.1. So it was, Bill Gates wrote me a reply. And he said, I don't think so. I think we're, whatever challenges the internet presents, people are still going to buy Encarta and Flight Simulator. And well, now we have the benefit of hindsight. Does anybody remember what Encarta was? It was Wikipedia. <laughs> and not as good as Wikipedia. It was a CD-ROM version of Wikipedia written by employees at Microsoft. Now, had you thought in 1994, what are the chances that um, a sort of ragtag community thing, all work, everybody working for free, anybody able to make a change to any page on this thing is somehow going to bring down the mighty Microsoft and, and um, analogously, how are a bunch of individuals writing blog posts going to have a significant impact on the news industry? Well, you have to look, if you want to understand how innovation happens, how creativity happens in technology, how change happens, I think you can predict the next cycle by looking at past cycles. And you have to be prepared to think in really outrageous terms. And when you are willing to relax your assumptions and say, OK, well, maybe we could do this a different way, no matter how ridiculous it seems, it's worth exploring it. Anybody have? Yes. Thank you so much. You have now saved my life twice. <laughs> So, looking back at past cycles, relaxing your assumptions, what do you see ahead? That's unfair. You should Not tell really. me what you see. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> what do I see? Okay, well, first of all, I have a great deal of admiration for, uh, for Facebook and for Zuckerberg. And because I've been watching what he does, and he also says, that he's learned from previous uh, examples. And I'm sure what he means by that is, is Bill Gates. You know, I mean, I don't, maybe Steve Jobs, maybe uh, a few others. I mean, you know, maybe it's not any single individual. Um, and what he's doing and what Google is doing also um, is, is fundamentally different. Uh, what, what I suggested, so, you know, when I, I wrote all these blog posts after that initial sort of uh, collision with Gates, which was actually put me on the map. I mean, he did me a huge favor by writing that piece because he gave me something to respond to. And, uh, and I didn't, I, I, I still respect him because, what, because anybody, who was it said Adolf Hitler was not smart? I mean, the first speaker said that. Adolf Hitler must have been very smart because, you know, uh, now, that's not the same thing as moral or uh, evil, not evil, or whatever. I mean, you could be very smart and be a really, really bad person. But, uh, you know, you have to look at how many people did what Bill Gates did. And, well, only Bill Gates did it. And so, therefore, it's, he's got to be really smart. And, uh, and what he did has to be really hard. Otherwise, everybody would have done it. Um, so what I had advised him to do was well, uh, to become an investment banker, to not try to force the changes through their organizations. Um, because if you, if, if you look at the way these organizations grow, and by the time the web came along, Microsoft was a very, very large company. Um, they're not driven by uh, whatever it is that drives individual creati creative people, the people inside the company, to the extent that they are creative, their creativity is, is applied to the, 
the politics of their company, the internal sort of inertia of it. And so these people, you know, the, the evolution of, of, you know, the survival of the fittest inside the company selects out a completely different set of qualities that are good at coming up with conclusions like that the internet is a feature of office. <laughs> That's what they concluded at Microsoft. Well, you see, that didn't do anybody any good. It certainly didn't do Microsoft any good because, uh, because they were fighting a losing battle. You know, they could, they could achieve a certain amount of success with that, but eventually it wouldn't work because it's simply not true. Uh, the web is not a feature of Office. The web is much, 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 much bigger than Office is. Um, so, you know, and I watched this happen and I thought, well, what would I do if I were Bill Gates? And what I would do is I would, you know, I would look at what my assets are. And my assets are a huge amount of cash and an incredible distribution machine. I mean, at that point, Microsoft could put software on basically every desk in the world. Um, and in the, in the business world. I mean, the, the consumer world hadn't grown that much at that point. So what they had was distribution, and they had tons of money and the ability to get as much money as they wanted, which were the things the web didn't have. And so what they could have done is they could have said, I'm going to buy a piece of everything that's out there moving, and then just step back and let it win. Let wh whoever wins win. And the theory would be that they would get 80% of the growth anyway because what this would do would be driving huge growth of the sales of computers, and Microsoft had a tax on the computers. They would get like $150 for every computer sold. So if you can make computers grow at a huge rate, Microsoft doesn't have to do anything but kick back. Microsoft doesn't have to own it. They don't have to be it. And regardless of whether they feel they have to be it or not, they can't be it because there's never been an example, and there never will be an example, of a big company that dominates two successive cycles uh, in, the, in technology. It just can't happen. Because the skills that it takes, the perspective it takes, the point of view that it takes to be successful in the insurrection, which is what the next generation of every, in every technology cycle, it's an insurrection. Um, are very vastly different from what it takes to be successful inside of a big company. And so Zuckerberg, you know, to flash forward to today, um, Zuckerberg is running a very big company. Uh, the people he's hired are out of the general talent pool of Silicon Valley, which means there are a lot of really smart people and there are a lot of very average people. And they're all really concerned about what Zuck thinks about everything. And the lieutenants have you know, personalities that are trying to please them too. But what he's doing is he's buying companies and leaving them alone. And he's making huge amounts of investments in other companies and, and not interfering with them. Um, he talks about uh, doing the opposite of what Microsoft did, which I think is smart, which is unbundling the... Um, <laughs> I have a camera in my face right now. <laughs> These conferences are so hard because they like dehumanize you, you know. Well, I'm not a TV star. I'm a blogger and a, and a coder. <laughs> but on the other hand, you guys have done a wonderful job. I don't want to take anything away from that. So, okay, so what, what is the next thing? Well, I can tell you some of the things I think it is, all right? One of them is I want to keep blogging, okay? And I don't want to try to fit my innovation, the work that I'm doing. And I am doing new stuff in blogging, believe it or not. Blogging, there's still a lot more to do with blogging. The tools that we use, WordPress, is, isn't even as good as what we were doing in the late 90s. They did not pick up all the great ideas, and there are a lot more great ideas out there to, uh, to apply to the right, you know, the web as a writing environment can be improved. And if you want to know what I think about that, go to, I, this is the only plug I'm going to put in here, Fargo, F-A-R-G-O dot I-O. That's my latest product. And if you want to know what I think, that's what I think. Uh, that, that there's a lot more to do there. Now, um, however, and this is what I'm sure we'll talk about this in the last uh, panel on uh, tomorrow. Um, you have to kind of be stubborn to want to blog today. I mean, 
it's, it's a fact. And I am that stubborn, for sure. And so I have never, ever even paused in my blogging. I keep doing it. Um, but every time I write a blog post, I feel a little bit of tension that I should be writing this on Facebook instead of writing it on my blog. And I mean, do you all understand that? Does that make sense to you? I mean, why would you want to do that? Well, because on Facebook, you get all this engagement, right? You have all these other people that are already assembled there and will comment on what you say and more people will see it. And it, it, it's not just a feeling, it's actually true. So what would be fantastic, and this, is, this, this isn't something I can do though, it depends on, uh, on, on Facebook having a vision, which I don't know if they do or they don't, but what they could do is make it possible for us to have our content, our blog posts exist where they are and also at the same time exist on Facebook so that we can drive innovation outside of the context of Facebook because we can do a lot of things that they can't do inside of their own little network there, or huge network. And, um, and then over time, pull those ideas into Facebook. I don't mind if they do that. As long as we have a mechanism to evolve new ideas outside of it, well that, that could be a win-win. Now that said, I doubt if that's the future, you know, because uh, I don't think big companies really uh, enable their demise. I think that as bright as Zuckerberg is, um, that was nice. They, all of a sudden, it's quiet in here. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Um, as bright as Zuckerberg is, he's hired a lot of people who are not as smart as he is, and, and they will drag him down eventually, um, as the people in Microsoft dragged Gates down, and, and vice versa. Gates dragged them down too, because, uh, well, I don't need to get into that, but um, so I'd like to think that when it happens, I'll know it, okay? That, that much I'll give, you know, I'll say, but it's... I can't tell you for sure that I will because I've missed things too, you know. Um, a famous, my own, in my mind, famous example of that is uh, desktop publishing. Do people remember desktop publishing? Um, wow, okay. We have to have gray beard to remember that one, I think, or gray hair or whatever. Um, well, desktop publishing was the idea that you could use a Macintosh to print newsletters. Now, that doesn't seem at all controversial today, right? But it did, it was controversial in the late 80s. And, uh, and I said, oh, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> it, it, it turned out to be vastly wrong, and had I not been so wrong, I would have made a lot more money. But, so it was a great lesson to learn that, that that idea that nobody wants to X, it's probably wrong. Whatever you're, it's, it's like those people who said they trust newspapers more than they trust. I mean, they're right. Um, if you, if you, how much, how are we doing on time, by the way? We still have time? Okay, good. Um, uh, there was an example a few days ago. There was this article that showed up uh, in my uh, RSS stream that said Charles Manson was about to be released from prison. And the, uh, people know who Charles Manson is? Char Charles Manson was a mass killer um, and a terrible person. He has a swastika tattooed in his forehead. Um, he's, and he talks openly about, I mean, he's old. He's in his 80s now. But he was a vicious, mean person who sh probably sh he should never get out of jail. And, uh, and all of a sudden, there are all these tweets out there saying, Charles Manson's getting out of jail. Of course, it's not true. Um, and I saw that and I decided not to push it out through my, you know, link network because when I did a search on it in Google News, I didn't find any prominent news organizations reporting it. So if anybody would find random news sources, I mean, the people who trust newspapers over random blogs are right. They're right to do that. And, but we've, we've got a, a serious new thing, a seriously dangerous thing is happening now where um, 
revenue officers at news organizations have learned that if they publish stories that aren't true, that are sensational, they can get a lot of hits. And, um, and that's really bad. <laughs> because it means that we're gonna get a lot more stories like that. And we're gonna to have to develop ways, so we do develop ways to discern them, and one of them is, you know, does the New York Times have the story? Uh, you know, does the Guardian or the BBC have the story? If they don't, I don't trust it. And so, uh, you know, there was another thing on that slide. I, I asked a question, I wanna get this in here. Well, uh, uh, I asked a question while she was speaking. Um, that uh, did, did fear of sharing data correlate with age? And my, my theory on that one was that we've forgotten how bad governments can be. Because, I mean, I, I, I was born after the war. My parents uh, fled uh, Europe for America. I'm first generation American, um, three quarters Jewish. Uh, had they not been successful at getting out, they, I wouldn't be here. Um, and they very much remember, my, uh, my parents did, and, and my grandparents especially, um, how bad governments can be because they almost destroyed them. Um, but I think that the further and further we get away from the fascism uh, and, the, and the, you know, the genocide and all the terrible things that happened in World War II, the more susceptible we are to it. Um, you know, this, there are terrible things happening in the United States with the Tea Party. Uh, there's a reboot of fascism in Europe. Uh, the recent elections did that. And I think it's just the naivete of the, uh, the electorate now has no recollection of what happened. So sometimes being older does make you, uh, I mean, we laugh. I mean, of course, I'm getting older myself. Uh, and so I tend to be more defensive of, pe of older people, uh, less dismissive of them. And I, you know, I think there's wisdom that comes with a fresh start. I mean, you can certainly see the advantages of people dying in the first graph that she put up, right? Because well, the people who want to get their news on print are wrong. <laughs> There's just no good, re I mean, in my opinion, I, I have to qualify that, but I think that it's, it's very, I mean, well, having said that, I'm gonna ask, I mean, do people feel here that print is, does anybody have a newspaper with them right now? Well, nobody's gonna answer that question, right? <laughs> okay, a very brave soul. Well, um, yes. I'm talking a lot, and I really would like other people to talk. It would be, it, I feel this is like a service I can do to this conference. Dave, I'm, uh, I work on the accessibility of the web, um, and accessibility of the web, whether people who have uh, vision disabilities or other disabilities can access what's on the web. And I think we know that at least 20% of people simply can't use what's published most of the time. And Microsoft, to their surprise, found 65% of people... Can't, 65% of the people can't... 65% of people would benefit if stuff that was on the web was fully accessible, you could change sure. the font size and so on. So when I look at those statistics that we were looking at, I ask, well, how many of the older people actually have failing eyesight oh. and have uh, problems controlling the mouse? And that accounts for quite a lot of their suspicion about what's going on. And I think we easily forget that. We sort of think they're silly old people. Um, if you can't access something, of course you're not going to. And I think it's an important point. Yeah. That's a, that's a very interesting point. Oh, yeah, yeah no, we, we, it's actually interesting because, uh, of course, we don't have a proof of this, and I'm sure you're quite right. Uh, again, though, let's not forget that the people, here we are talking about the digital natives, right? So it's like in 100 years from now, I don't think people of 60 years old of age would say the same things. Well, well there, part, of, part of them it's true. The, you know, the physical, um, let's say, denial. No, but about a lot she of has a theory that can't be tested for another 100 years. I mean, you can't, we can't know, right? But it still is an interesting point of view. I mean, um, personally, I, I don't think that's what it is. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, you know, I only have, I don't have any statistics on it. My mother uh, does, still reads the newspaper um, every day. 
the same way she always has. Um, and she can also use the web. She doesn't have any trouble doing it. It's not that she couldn't read the news on the web. Uh, uh, she, and she, I'm sure she does read the news on the web, but she still reads the newspaper. Um, I, but, I'm, but I don't have any wisdom on this. I just am telling you my opinion, that's all. Now let's understand that your opinion is perfectly valid and, and it's an interesting thing to, to ask about. And there's another conclusion to it that there's no harm in making things more accessible. There's no harm in, in, in studying it and learning how to make uh, the, the computers more welcoming to all people. Um, I know I find that my eyesight, you know, I'm 59 years old and my eyesight is nowhere near as good as it was. And I don't, I hate websites that have uh, white type on a black background. They leave trails on my eyes. It literally deforms my vision to read them. Um, and sometimes the type is just so tiny. Uh, but there are things like readability that help that. And so if I absolutely, well, for me they do at least. I'm just saying, yes. I think there are techniques and there's knowledge about how to do it, but I think we are deniers of the need to do it. And so that's right. the problem. That well, We know that something like 3% of the web, of the important stuff that people want, is actually accessible to everyone. Right. And that's a very, very Good low point. proportion. Excellent point. Yes? Um, so I, I have, a, have an anecdote about the Microsoft web thing. Um, my um, my Co husband and, and colleague were, were doing in, 90, in 1995 a project for web TV uh, at Microsoft. And when they went to Redmond, they couldn't do what they were trying to do because port 80 was blocked um, inside Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So um, the, it, interestingly, there, there are things that we can do in the interest of staying, of staying safe that prevent us from being able to embrace the future. And in that case, they had a huge fight on their hands in order to be able to you know, get access to the web from inside the buildings. Um, Interesting. And I don't know whether or not your, your contribution there helped crack that loose, but. Well, at this point, nobody, it probably doesn't even matter that much, but it, the point, let me see if I understood that, is like, they couldn't develop their own software because they couldn't access the web over port 80 inside of Microsoft? I see. Yes, and that would be an example of a corporation getting in its own way, and unable to, to see why, yeah. You wouldn't have any trouble in a startup being able to access port 80 if you're operating out of a Starbucks or a, uh, you know, internet cafe or whatever, shared office space somewhere. Who's next? Oh, we were doing so well there. Oh. Awesome. We got somebody way in the back. Cool. Hello. Yep. He hello. <laughs> Uh, can I ask you something about uh, blogging in general, just opinion, something like that? About what? Uh, blogging. Oh, sure. Yeah. I know, I've heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I've just been uh, looking at your website and blog and stuff. So, uh, yeah, for you and for everybody here, um, what, what do you prefer, like, uh, what do you think would have a better impact? Uh, short um, sentences, short statements like tweets? or like a, a short paragraph, two, three, about whatever happened to you. So just what would be the better way to, you know, express it, your whatever opinion, well, your... Well, that's it. Um, I think the, uh, the answer, well, what do I think? What I think is that uh, human expression comes in many, many forms. Uh, and so, you know, I could say it's hot outside today. I can fit that in a tweet, there's no problem. Um, but there are many ideas that I can't fit in 140 characters. And, um, uh, and there are ideas, so I, I write short things, I write long things, and my blogging software can handle them both equally well. Um, interestingly, this was something that I had working many years ago, and then, and then with the advent of two pieces, two big dominant products, Twitter and Google Reader, both forced my blog almost into non-existence. So one of the things I did was I took the short little bits that I had on my blog. My blog is at scripting.com, by the way, if you want to see what he's talking about. Um, is, and I took the short things and I put them on Twitter um, because Google Reader couldn't deal with them. Google Reader had a limit that every post had to have a title, okay? Well, 
What's the title of a tweet that says it's hot outside today? I guess you could say weather status <laughs> is, the is the title, but that's kind of stupid. Why would you want to put a title on a tweet, right? So Google Reader couldn't handle tweets. And therefore, I couldn't put tweet length stuff on my blog. Oh, I got complaints all the time from people saying, uh, your site is broken in Google Reader, which I felt was a little unfair considering that my site predated Google Reader by many years, and the format that they were using was one that was originated on my site. You know, it, it, you get over that, right? This is what I, what I was saying before, is that no, nobody cares what you think, they care what they think. <laughs> and so eventually I gave up. But when Google Reader went away, I, I, I said, and then I realized after about six months, I'm still limiting my blog based on a piece of software that no longer exists. That doesn't seem very smart, you know? And even so, uh, the, the current crop of feed readers, uh, um, they, none of them really do anything decent with tweet, uh, with tweet length blog posts, but I don't care. I'm still putting them in my feed and, and I'm letting them be broken so that their users complain. And I've also shipped some software and I'm gonna be very aggressive about promoting it uh, that doesn't have the limit. And it's open source, and you can run it anywhere you want. We're going to make it really easy to run it anywhere you want. And that's who, this is another thing I've learned, is that people don't listen to their friends. They listen to their competitors. And so if, so I could say to Feedly, would you please make my blog look good in your, you know, in your service? And they go, well, thank you very much, Dave, for the input. We'll see when we can get to it, you know, and they never do. Um, but if I have a product, you know, I, my challenge is I have to make a product that hurts them. Be, and then they will do it. <laughs> I mean, that's for sure. Uh, I've learned this over the years that if you want to get people to do things, you don't ask them to do it, you compete with them. And uh, once you're a competitor and you're in the market and they feel your presence, they will follow you. They'll do exactly what you want them to do. And so I don't mind doing that. I had to learn how to program in node.js. But that was a lot of fun, and so we're... So the answer to your question is, well, there's also another aspect to this, too, is that um, if there was only one size of tweet, why ever go talk at a conference, right? I mean, here I am, how many words am I using? And, you know, this is not very well written, I promise you. I mean, if you would actually take a transcript of this and go, God, what an idiot, you know? But it sounds good when you say it, when you speak it. You know? And doing a podcast is good, too. I do podcasts. Um, when I have a complicated idea that needs persuasiveness, where you have to use uh, intonation and, uh, and repetition and, and, and try to create some kind of a human connection. So that's another form of blogging, you know, and it's perfectly valid. Now, not as many people will read this blog post, the one that I'm doing here right now, and, you know, maybe a few more people would listen to a podcast, um, a blog post may be read by more, a lot more people and a, a tweet by even more, but each of them has its value. Uh, there are so many different forms of communication and, and I'm sure we haven't invented all of them yet either. So that was a really great question though. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Hi. Uh, I just have, a, I, want, I want to take you back to Facebook and Zuckerberg, if you don't mind. Can you raise your hand? I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, here okay, I, I got it. See okay, you. Yeah. Hi. Okay, hi. Um, I wanted just to go back to Facebook and sure. Zuckerberg, if you don't mind. I wanted to ask you, it's true, I agree with you entirely. Of course, Facebook is a fact of life. Right. We're not going to ignore it and uh, just be snobbish Good. about it, right? right yes. Um, do you also think that it's, do you, do you think it's just that, or do you think there's something good in Facebook? Yes. And if you think there's something that you criticize, what, what, what would be the first thing that would come to your mind? The, wait, you asked if I think there's something good in one, it? The, one good thing, the best thing, and the worst thing in Facebook. I'd like to hear your oh, I'm comments no expert on that. Oh, I'm no expert on that. I mean... Uh, no, your personal opinion. I think, fine. I think Facebook is good. I mean, I think it's a very well done piece of software. Um, and uh, it's quite easy to use. Um, uh, I could give you a lot of things that I think they could do better. Um, I, you know, there are some very basic, uh, oh, I'd like to be able to bold a word every so often. Why can't I put a link on text? I mean, they've taken features out of the web. I mean, you know, this is on the web, and the web has the ability to link. 
I mean, why can't I link from some place to other? Why don't Facebook posts have titles? I mean, it seems to me if I can write a, a, an essay in Facebook, I should be able to give it a title. So people have a sense of, and I put the titles on them anyway, but people don't know that they're titles. You know, they're, they're, they're not set off in any way. Um, but I don't think that there's any, uh, I think I, f I feel I need to add, I don't think they would, uh, I don't think these features are omitted because they're bad people. I think that software, I mean, I have a, I wrote a blog post in, I think it was 95, uh, uh, called We Make Shitty Software. And, uh, and this was a slogan at my first company. And it's not the kind of thing a lot of people understand, but it's, it's a good thing to believe that you do because everybody does it. Um, your soft, my software sucks and it's totally inadequate. It has bugs. It's going to lose data but it'll get better. And that's the promise, that's the commitment you make. If, if you use it and you help me popularize it, if we can get this thing going, then I will commit that it's a process. And um, so uh, they're perfectly entitled to ship shitty software and, and, and I expect that it will be and I just, I just hope they make it better. You know, uh, a, another example, I'm also a, a long-term Twitter user, I was like the, 3,000th Twitter user. Uh, so I've been using it from the very beginning and I've done a lot of development in Twitter. And that's a much worse example of a product that just refuses to move. I mean, they, they are, uh, they add a few features every now and then, but they don't add any features for me. You know, um, they add features to try to build their market and, you know, to draw in more uh, naive users. And uh, their core users, though, they don't seem to care about very much or understand. It could be that they don't understand it because they don't use their own product at Twitter. Um, but there are some really bewildering omissions in it. Like, why can't I delete somebody else's tweet that's in my stream? You know, suppose somebody said something really offensive to me, you know, and I go back to my notifications tab and it just stays there. It won't go away, <laughs> you know. So I have, to, I have to block the person, right? Or now they have the mute feature, which I think is wonderful. I think it's a great, it's a great sign of progress, but it's really for six years, if that's the extent of the features, I mean, software should move at something of a, a useful rate, you know? So I think you have to gauge them by the rate at which they're um, addressing uh, user features. Uh, I, you know, Facebook probably could do it a lot faster, but I don't, also don't know the, uh, the realities of running a network. And this is true of Twitter, too. I don't know what it's like to run a network that size. I mean, it must have totally unique challenges. Uh, for all I know, on Twitter, maybe if you allow people to delete tweets, you need twice as many servers. I don't believe that's true, by the way, but it, you, know, you have to keep an open mind. And would they tell us that that was true? No because that would also be telling their competition. So um, I, th I think I answered your question and, and a little bit more too. So okay, one, last question. one last question. Yeah, Luciano. L Luca. Oh, Luca, sorry. Hi. <laughs> I'm bad with names. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, Alan. Uh, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, Touche. <anyway. laughs> oh, grazie. <laughs> No, I was, uh, I was uh, thinking about one of the phrases that you used, uh, new generation of technologies, sort of insurrection, which I think it's very sure. interesting to, to think about, um, which is linked to the idea that I first heard from uh, David Weinberger, who said uh, that innovation uh, doesn't need to act, ask for permission. And one of the preconditions for this to happen is that the network stays net neutral. Net neutrality is not very well understood, but is something that we need to defend, I think. Uh, of course, uh, we know that in the States they are discussing about the very principle of uh, net neutrality. In the mobile network, it already doesn't exist. Uh, or uh, is not a principle that every operator is uh, 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 accepting. But we don't have net neutrality. Uh, we, so what so do you think that we need to do for net neutrality? Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, 
I, I literally don't know because we don't have it. Um, you know, my, I can't, I mean, there are all kinds of levels. The, the internet is a, is a, a you know, it's a, it's a many level thing. It's like an onion, right? So there are all these different layers. You're talking about just one layer. Um, I would like to be able to write an op-ed for the New York Times, but I can't. Uh, Thomas Friedman's op-eds are given a much higher priority than mine. He can put one on there every, you know, twice a week. I can put one on there never. So uh, the, you can't have net neutrality. Um, and what you're really talking about is a game that's being played between, you know, multinational, multi-trillion dollar, well, that's an exaggeration, multi-billion dollar corporations. And you and I are insects compared, we don't really have any appreciation for, we're being used, you know, to the extent that we rally for net neutrality, uh, we're not representing our interests, we're being pawns for, their, for them. Um, so, you know, there's a, uh, your insurrection has to come in a different way. It, it can't come here. Um, and uh, you have to pick your battles very carefully. And one, you want to pick battles that you have a chance of winning. And you want to pick, your, uh, pick the battles that will have some material outcome on your well-being if you do win them. This is one of those cases where, um, you know, why do we assume that Netflix is a better a better company than uh, Time Warner or Comcast or you know whatever AT and T. Uh, I I mean I, I like Netflix, but I I don't believe any corporation is better than any other. I've been on the board of directors of a Silicon Valley company. I know how they operate. Um, these are not nice people. They, they wouldn't even want you to believe that they're nice people. Uh, they don't care whether you believe they're nice people or not. Now they hire PR firms and advertising agencies to help you believe that they're nice people because that makes it easier for them to fight with uh, AT&T and, and Comcast and the rest of them. Um, you know, uh, in New York City, we have terrible internet service. That's a battle I would pick. <laughs> I would like to see something happen. I'd like to know why we have such bad internet access in New York City. Um, and. Uh, you know, so that I, to answer your question, and I think this is the end, right? Uh, pick your battles, I guess would be what I would say. Thank you very much. Wow. Oh, I mean, grazie.